So the oil and gas sector has for many years had for many years has had a significant number of migrant workers due to shortages in the UK labour market for specific skills. And those numbers do fluctuate from, ten, from time to time, but there tends to be around 10% of the workforce who are from outside of the UK, and that number is far higher in specific jobs. So the changes to the immigration rules, which will bite at the end of the Brexit transition period, will be really significant for the sector. And whilst everybody's attention has been on COVID in recent months, and we will mention some changes relating to that at the start of the session, just to get everyone up to speed, we thought that now would be a good time to focus attention back on the changes that will come into force from the 1st of January 2021. And those are the most significant immigration changes that we have seen for many, many years. There isn't, of course, a whole separate immigration set of rules for the sector, but I will try to focus on some parts of the rules which are likely to be most relevant. I'm also then going to move on to speak about the settlement scheme and the impact of significant absences from the UK on that, as we've had quite a few oil and gas clients seek advice on that as a result of COVID-related absences and EU nationals spending months outside of the UK. And then I'm going to hand over to Fiona, who's going to cover the UK quarantine rules, which came in um, at the beginning of June and which are, of course, relevant to the sector. And Fiona will cover some sector specific exemptions in relation to those. So starting with some COVID related uh, specific measures that are in place, just to bring everybody up to date. Um, and COVID has, of course, impacted the immigration rules and processing in a very significant way in the same that it's impacted every area of life. Um, but I thought I'd touch on a few changes just for employers to be aware of. So first of all, right to work checks um, have been relaxed during COVID and those changes came in from the 30th of March and are still in place. That's meant that it's possible to carry out right to work checks to get staff started. Um, even if you can't do a check in person, it's possible to use video calls to do those checks. You just need to mark on it that it's a COVID adjusted check. And then once this concession comes to an end, employers are going to have a grace period of eight weeks to carry out a normal kind of face to face check. Um, and we'll be providing updates when the, these concessions um, are ending. The other um, Temporary measures which are in place have been as a result of various different visa processing centres which have been closed and not able to sort of um, process visa applications in the usual way. So for a period of months, all of the UK visa processing centres were closed. They've now started to resume um, opening up on a kind of phased basis. We've had a certain number in England open from the 1st of June. Um, as of this week, some of the Scottish visa application centres have started to open, but some of them won't actually open until the summer and even into the autumn. The Aberdeen Processing Centre is open from the 10th of July. Um, so things are, are starting to resume as normal, but there will be a back, backlog of applications from the period where all of those were closed. English language uh, test facilities and life in the UK test facilities have also been closed but are now are also starting to resume but again we'll have a big backlog and that's meant that people have not been able to apply for the usual visa documentation that they would need uh, to submit applications. So as a result of those UK visas and immigration have put temporary measures in place to deal with those and I'll talk about those in a moment <clears throat> but there are also temporary concessions in place um, which has been good news for employers basically to allow switching within the UK from certain temporary visa categories into more permanent ones where individuals would normally have had to have left the UK, travelled back home and then come back in. Um, but obviously to avoid unnecessary, unnecessary travel, um, UK visas and immigration have put special concessions in place up until the 31st of July for that. So it's good to know about that if it's relevant to any employees in your workforce. So yeah, a couple of the temporary um, concessions that are in place to deal with COVID. Um, first of all, for those who've got temporary visas and are in the UK in order to avoid them having uh, become sort of overstayers in their visas, UK Visas and Immigration set up a temporary process to allow individuals to easily apply for a short term extension to their visa. 
initially that was up to the end of May and then they brought in a further concession to allow people to get a, a further visa extension up to the end of July. So those concessions are still there. Individuals just complete a short application form and it will mean that in, those individuals won't become overstayers or illegal, which is obviously important if you're hosting visitors, for example, in the UK um, and if they can't leave because of COVID related travel restrictions or because they're self-isolating because of COVID. The next slide um, deals with a further concession which is in place in relation to people who need to or plan to stay in the UK on a longer term basis. So I mentioned earlier that some UK visa application centres have started to reopen but some remain closed and there is a backlog there. So as long as individuals do the online bit of their application, they make their visa application online before the expiry date of their current visa. Um, UK visas and immigration have said that individuals won't be disadvantaged because of COVID, that they'll be able to submit their supporting documents once those are available at a later date. So for example, if you've not been able to do an English language test, if you submit that at a later date, that's not going to disadvantage you. And once everything resumes as normal, individuals will then go along, get their biometrics taken and will get a decision on their visa. Um, but in the meantime, the good news for employers is that anyone on a tier two visa, for example, can get started in their new job, despite the fact that their visa has not been fully processed. Um, so that's quite a significant uh, concession. They do need to have had their certificate of sponsorship issued and to have done that online bit of the application, but provided they've done that, they can get started. And if there was an issue in refusing the visa at a later date, the individual would obviously have to stop work at that point. But yeah, worth knowing that those concessions are there just now. A couple of other um, reporting concessions which are in place. Again, good news for employers. Temporary homeworking doesn't need to get reported through the sponsor management system, which is good news because lots of employers have had lots and lots of people working at home, of course. Uh, permanent changes do still need to be reported and we've been advising quite a lot of oil and gas clients on changes, I guess, that need to be reported to job titles or salaries and things like that through the sponsor management system. And normally those do need to be made within 10 days, so we're thinking about that. And then um, a further concession um, has been made in relation to to COVID related absences of four weeks or more without pay. Normally that would actually cease the um, ability to sponsor somebody, but that's not the case provided it is COVID related, uh, a COVID related reason. And remember if you are, for example, repatriating employees on a temporary basis, some employers have sent staff home back to sort of head offices, et cetera, that could result in uh, reporting obligations. And we've also been advising on those. So I thought it might be useful just to cover a few other reporting obligations just to think about because lots of oil and gas clients will be involved in restructuring just now, whether that's making redundancies, changes to job roles, pay cuts um, or any other changes at all. Most of those things will result in um, reporting obligations if you're doing that in relation to tier two employees. So for example, any changes to job titles, et cetera, have to get reported through the sponsor management system. Certain significant changes to somebody's job, for example, if you were to make them redundant but offer them an alternative role, may even result in a requirement to sponsor them afresh. So if that's a, a risk, I would sort of suggest taking advice in relation to that. Um, UK Visas and Immigration has provided um, a, a specific concession in relation to pay cuts if they're along the lines of the furlough scheme. So if you're planning or if you have um, furloughed staff and are paying them either the £2,500 or 80% of their salary, that allows you to dip below the normal salary thresholds. But there are reporting obligations that go along with that and restrictions in relation to that. Um, and yet any scenario where you are terminating employment is likely to um, trigger a reporting obligation through the sponsor management system and is likely to result in the curtailment of somebody's leave. So something to think about if you're making any tier two employees redundant. So I'm going to move on now to talk a bit about the new points based system, which, as I said, is coming in from the 1st of January. Um, so 
applications um, under the scheme are going to open in the autumn. That's obviously not very far away. Um, so being ready and aware of what those changes will mean is important right now. Um, at the moment, the plan is for the Brexit transition period to come to an end at the end of the calendar year. So at 11 o'clock on the 31st of December, um, the government said it's not going to ask for an extension to that. The deadline for the ability to ask for an extension is coming up in just a few days so on the 1st of July and um, that's when we'll know for sure that it is ending at the end of the year and in any case uh, the government is planning to bring in the new points based system on the 1st of January 2021 so we do need to prepare for that. As I said at the start that's one of the most um, major changes to our immigration rules in many years and it will involve having a single skills based system that's not based on nationality any longer so we won't have one system for EU nationals and one system for everyone else. Everyone will be under the umbrella of a single skills based system um, and uh, similar to our current rules, employers must be a licensed sponsor. Lots of you on the call will already have a sponsor license in place, but for anyone who doesn't, it is worth getting one in place as soon as possible because of COVID, there's likely to be a backlog and we are expecting a significant number of employers to be applying for sponsor licenses over the sort of second half of this calendar year as we reach the sort of 1st of January um, deadline because lots of people will need a licence when they haven't had to have had one before. Um, and there's currently a special concession in place for those applying for licences before the end of June, which means you can sort of use scans instead of original documents. So that might be worth uh, cracking on and doing that if you're thinking of, of doing it. Uh, the UK government uh, brought out a policy statement in February this year confirming some details in relation to the new rules so we'll look at those briefly but the key things to note are, are that the new rules will cover medium skilled jobs for the first time as well as highly skilled jobs significantly opening up the numbers of roles that are going to be available for tier two sponsorship so that's good news for employers. Um, the resident labour market test is to be abolished. Again, great news for employers that will cut back on timing and paperwork in terms of sponsoring anyone. And also the immigration cap is going to be abolished. Um, again, good news um, that will avoid restrictions on numbers. Um, and it will also cut out some of the process and delays that have been involved in the current rules where we've had two types of uh, certificate of sponsorship that's going to change. Um, the minimum salary levels under the new rules is also going to drop down to 25,600 or the going rate for the job. So again, good news, kind of increasing the flexibility of the new scheme. But one, um, I guess, important thing for employers to think about is if you have been sponsoring lots of uh, or had lots of EU nationals working for you, the visa costs can be significant in terms of outlays to the government when you add up all the charges together, together the um, approximate costs per head are currently around eight and a half thousand. That's likely to rise to about ten thousand pounds in October when the immigration health uh, surcharge is increased. So roughly ten thousand pounds per head, albeit that that varies depending on a number of factors. But um, that's worth thinking about in terms of budgeting. So the new rules um, are going to be similar to the current tier two system. There might be a rebranding or a badging of, of the new rules, but you will still need a job offered by an approved sponsor. That's still going to be at a specific skill level, albeit that it will be medium skilled as well as highly skilled. There still will be an English language requirement there. And although that minimum salary level that I mentioned will be a baseline in many cases, there are exceptions where somebody is either on the shortage occupation list or if they've got a PhD in a STEM subject or a relevant um, a subject which is relevant to the job. So it's worth thinking about there are some lower salaries um, which will be eligible for sponsorship down to that baseline of £20,480. And there are also concessions for kind of new entrants, so younger people starting their careers for the first time. So um, just worth thinking about that. Um, So the shortage occupation list, as, as I mentioned, there's situations where you can pay less if a job is on that. There are a number of those already which are relevant for the oil and gas sector, which I'll touch on in a moment. But the occupation shortage occupation list is being reviewed by the Migration Advisory Committee at the moment. 
They are reporting on that in September 2020, so before the new rules come into place, and it may be that certain jobs are added or removed from that list. There is a separate list for Scotland, and there are certain jobs which are only relevant to specific sectors, so worth taking a look at that. Um, and at the moment it covers around about 10% of the jobs in the UK. So the ones which are relevant for the oil and gas sector just now, I've put up lots of engineering jobs up there. Um, some of you will be familiar with using those, um, but it is, it's, it's useful if the job is on there. At the moment, that means that it's exempt from the resident labour market test, but going forward, that difference won't be there. But there still are benefits to being in the shortage occupation list in terms of lower fees, etc. And if we look at the next slide, um, these are physical scientists jobs which are in the shortage occupation list. And uh, at the bottom of the slide there, it lists out all of those which are relevant to the oil and gas sector. Hopefully those will stay on the list once they review it in September, um, but worth checking in just to make sure that that is the case. Um, so before we leave the sort of new points-based system, it's just worth remembering in addition to tier two, which is what kind of most employers do use if they want to bring someone into the UK to work, is that alongside tier two, there is also the global talent scheme. And actually a lot of engineering roles that are endorsed um, under that, that doesn't require the employer to act as a sponsor. It's a separate route that the individual can get a visa for. They get a um, specific body to endorse them and then they can work on a self-employed or employed basis, which might be useful for those who do currently work on a kind of self-employed basis because tier two really is uh, mainly for employees. And also the government has indicated the possibility of opening up a new unsponsored route as well. We used to have that um, based on somebody's attributes such as their education levels and age, etc. And the government is considering doing that. So we may have other options available to consider if sponsorship is not suitable or if, if that's just an easier route to go for. And then importantly, there is no plan to open an, a low skilled route might not be so relevant for some aspects of oil and gas sector, but it might be relevant if you've got lots of European nationals working in certain low paid um, or lower skilled jobs that we're not going to have, um, have that replaced in terms of the new rules. So I'm now going to move on to talk about the EU settlement scheme and managing absences from the UK. And I thought I would cover this because we've had a number of clients asking for advice in this. So um, individuals, European nationals who are already in the UK will be able to, um, to stay provided that they are resident before this cutoff date of the 31st of December 2020 at 11 p.m. They will be able to apply through the EU um, sort of settlement scheme to remain beyond the end of the transition period and they'll have a grace period of up to the end of June 2021 to do so. Um, settlement scheme applications have continued to be processed throughout COVID, um, but it is likely that COVID will cause a sort of backlog in applications and that some processing will take longer than usual. They weren't fully operational um, uh, during the COVID related sort of period. And also in, in practice, a lot of individuals just didn't apply. So we saw in the lockdown period, for example, in April, it was only roughly sort of 10% of the people applied that month um, as compared to, for example, October last year. And um, so the main message for employers is to encourage your staff to apply if they haven't done so already. Don't wait until close to the end of the sort of cutoff period. Um, because if anyone does have problems with their settlement scheme application at the moment, you could just reapply again. Your status is still legal for now. But if you start having problems afterwards, it may be that you've got staff working for you who may become illegal and not able to work for you while they try to resolve their settlement scheme application. So encouraging staff to go ahead and apply is important. <clears throat> um, in terms of what the settlement scheme provides for people, they will either get indefinite leave to remain, so settled status, um, if they've been in the UK and resident for five years or more, and if they've got continuous residence. But the people we've been advising in relation to are those who are eligible for the sort of less good pre-settled status. So folk who've been in the UK uh, for less than five years would be given a five-year visa, um, which allows them to accrue the service that they need to eventually apply for indefinite leave to remain. Um, but in order to do that, they need to have this five years continuous residence, 
um, and that's where the absences come in, which I'll kind of look at, look at in my next slide. Um, so an absence of six months or more in any rolling 12 month period can break your continuous residence. Um, so if somebody was during the lockdown period or whatever to have uh, spent several months outside of the UK, um, which resulted in a total of six months over that 12 month period, if you add other holiday absences or business related absences or people spending time outside of the UK as well, it may mean that they would then in the longer term not be able to hit that five year continuous residence period necessary to be able to stay in the UK on a longer term basis. Um, there are um, exceptions where you can have a one-off absence of up to 12 months for an important reason, but you'll see from that slide there that COVID-related absences isn't on there. Um, so it remains to be seen what approach um, the government will take if individuals have ended up spending lots of time outside of the UK and have broken their continuous residence and whether that um, impacts them in the longer term. So is there a solution to this? Well, if you um, have applied for pre-settled status or if you've got staff who've done that and then they've broken their period of continuous residence, it is possible to start the clock again if they apply for a new five-year pre-settled uh, pre-settled status visa. Um, they can start the clock again as long as they do that before the end of this calendar year and then they will be able to accrue their five years uh, residence necessary. But I would say if you've got people in that position, come and take advice about the best thing to do um, and we could look at whether um, they do have a problem or not in the kind of longer term, because you don't want people to end up having to leave the UK at the end of their five year visa and not qualify for indefinitely to remain. So practical tips, as I said, get your staff to apply into the settlement scheme early. Be mindful of those absences, especially if people are in and out of the UK frequently, um, which a lot of oil and gas clients will have, um, and signposting staff to information sources um, if necessary. So I'll hand over to Fiona now. Great, thanks Elaine. So I'm just going to uh, end the session by having a quick look at the new quarantine rules. Um, so these came into force on the 8th of June, so we've had them for a couple of weeks now. Um, new legislation has been um, implemented in order to bring these rules into force um, and we know that they're going to be reviewed every three weeks, so there will be a review on the 29th of June. Um, we also know that they've been amended, the legislation has been amended twice already, so things that maybe weren't quite right in the initial uh, piece of legislation has now been fixed, so we will wait with interest to see whether further changes are made on the 29th of June or shortly thereafter. But essentially what we're looking at is a sort of two-step regime. Um, there's the completion of a contact locator form, so people who are arriving in the UK um, are going to be required to complete this form it's available for completion up to 48 hours in advance of their arrival in the UK and it provides some basic information about them, um, including where they're going to be for the first 14 days that they're in the UK, um, because there will also then be the requirement that they self-isolate for that 14 days. And the idea is that obviously if they become ill or if anybody who travelled in, so it's say on the same flight as them, for example, becomes ill from COVID, then there's a mechanism of catching everybody who was on that flight um, and informing them of that development and asking them to take the necessary steps. Um, at the moment, it applies to all countries, save for Ireland, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, um, so that common uh, travel area. What we know is that uh, consideration is being given to whether there can be these sort of travel corridors where other countries will be exempt, but uh, that's not, there's nothing further on that at the moment, we just know it's being considered. Um, but then we have got a specific list of exemptions um, in relation to certain jobs, and I thought we should have a look at some of those uh, that might be relevant in an oil and gas context. Um, so you might be aware that there's um, extensive guidance that's been produced um, on this topic available online and the guidance, um, I've set out some of the exemptions. So I've talked about the common travel area, for example, people transiting airside. So if they arrive in the UK, but they don't actually pass border control. People who live in the UK um, but work in another country and travel between the two um, at least once a week or vice versa. Now that's an interesting one. That's They're called frontier workers. There's no exemption in Scotland, but there would be an exemption in England. Um, so we've got to spat sort of a, a disconnect between the two approaches there. 
And then in terms of sort of specific oil and gas exemptions, there's a downstream one, there's an upstream one, and then we've got an exemption in relation to um, seamen and masters, which might be relevant in the context of sort of mobile um, platforms, mobile uh, rigs, uh, rather than fixed ones. But I think the really important thing to note is that the guidance doesn't match the wording in the legislation exactly. So if you are considering a situation and wondering whether or not there might be an exemption, the guidance is sort of helpful in that it gives you a bit of a steer but you'd always want to look at the legislation and you'd want to make sure you're looking at the right legislation because each of the devolved nations has introduced their own legislation and as I've said they're not all the same and um, so that's just sort of a cautionary note on that and I've just flagged an example on the next slide um, where for example the uh, guidance talks about workers required for continued safe and secure operation maintenance and essential support services for offshore oil and gas infrastructure in the UK uh, but actually when you look at the Scottish legislation what's covered by that is is quite detailed and quite broad and um, so a good reason why you want to make sure that you're looking um, at the legislation and in relation to this exemption in particular you'll know that there's a lot um, been in the press recently around the extent of this exemption um, and what does it mean for UK residents who work on platforms outside of the UK CS because at the moment the exemption is very much focused on people who are working in the UK and on the UK CS so we've sort of got this two-tier regime where people who are UK residents but perhaps traveling to a platform on the Norwegian's um, CS are not covered by the exemptions. We know that's being looked at and I guess we'll see whether um, as part of this first review anything is done in relation to that. Um, why is it all important? So it's important because there are consequences for, for non-compliance. It's being dealt with as a matter of criminal law, which again means the approach being taken in Scotland is slightly different to the approach being taken in England. It will be fines which will be issued by way of fixed penalty um, notices and there is a fine or a fixed penalty notice that can be issued by border force if you refuse to fill in the contact form. Um, and then there's a separate fine that can be issued if you fail to quarantine and that's something that's obviously governed or, or regulated by uh, Police Scotland. So you're looking at a £60 fine if you um, don't fill in the form. I can't really imagine why people wouldn't fill in the form but that's the fine for it if you don't. Um, and then £480 if you fail to comply with the quarantine. It's £1,000 in England so um, considerably less up here. Um, it was reported yesterday that 3,200 people um, arrived in Scotland uh, since these new rules came into force and 18% applied for um, exemptions. So I thought that that was quite um, interesting in terms of the number of people who are looking for exemptions and the overall message as per the reports yesterday was that actually compliance levels have been very high so um, obviously the government will be pleased with that. Um, so what does this mean in terms of your business visitors and also in relation to your employees? So for your visitors, you're going to want to think about this 14-day um, period if it's going to apply to them. So are there any exemptions um, available? If there's not, and they're going to have to quarantine for the 14 days, then factor that into the timing of their business trip. What is it that they are coming to the UK to do? Um, and when are they going to do that? Because obviously they'll be restricted during the first 14 days. Where are they going to stay? How are they going to get there? There's really a very limited reasons um, why you can leave your accommodation whilst you're quarantining. So um, are they going to, how are they going to get supplies for food and, and anything else that they need, for example, during that 14 day period that should all be planned um, in advance. I think it's also just worth thinking about once your employees are traveling for personal reasons. So um, it will be people who are desperate to head off to sort of sunnier uh, climates for a bit of a holiday um, and that once what you know what, assuming that they're able to do that that will be fine from a sort of logistical perspective but from an employment relationship perspective if they then need to um, quarantine for 14 days when they get back is that something that they can do whilst also undertaking work for you so if they're working from home for example you could well see a situation where they perhaps travel abroad for their seven days holiday and then for the 14 days that they are um, Im immediately after that once they're back in the UK that they're just working from home and um, whilst complying with the quarantining um, rules but if they can't work from home um, are you paying them are you not paying them what sort of leave is that classified as I think it's worthwhile starting to think about that now and perhaps even starting to communicate with your workforces about the approaches that you're going to take in relation to that. 
if um, an employee does qualify for an exemption, they'll still have to complete the passenger form, but they won't have to um, self-isolate for the 14 days. Um, employers should be providing employees with um, letters to confirm the arrangements that are in place in terms of the work that they'll be doing and your contact details as well and um, just so that they have as much material available to them at the point that they arrive in the UK so that if they are questioned in addition to them being able to show that they've completed um, the passenger locator form they can also then provide a copy of a letter that you provided um, to them in support of that um, and similarly it's suggested that if you have issued them with photo ID then you should um, ask them to make sure that they bring that with them when they're travelling to the UK. Um, conscious um, of the time, Elaine, have you looked to see if there's any questions? Um, there is one here which I don't know if you know the answer to, but in relation to this section you just um, delivered, hasn't the Scottish Government laid new regulations in Parliament this week to address some of the discrepancies around the mariner exemption yeah um, so the mariner exemption so that well so seamen and masters there was a discrepancy between um, the approaches being taken in scotland and england and that has now been addressed and um, the person who's asked that question is absolutely right that's been fixed what we haven't yet seen is a fix for the fact that the um upstream oil and gas exemption, the pure oil and gas exemption for upstream matters and relates to UK activity and not non-UK activity. So there's still a disconnect there and we'll wait and see if that gets fixed. Okay, good. Have you got any questions there for... Um, so there's a question here around when the new rules come into force, how much faster will a tier two visa be with the abolition of the resident labour market test and the cap? Um, well, we're still waiting for some detail on how the new rules will work, but I would have expected it would make a huge difference because at the moment we've got 28 day advertising periods to go through a period of time kind of going through a selection process and considering those applications. So you'll be able to cut out all of that timing wise. Mm. Um, and often employers have had to go back and sort of re-advertise roles in accordance with these specific rules to do the resident labour market test. So that will cut out a lot of time and also under the current restrictions because of the immigration cap, some employers have had to, to have waited and applied for a certificate of sponsorship on a kind of monthly cycle. So yeah, I think it might cut out something like sort of six to eight weeks or something in terms of sponsorship, which is great and will also cut out lots of po uh, paperwork and admin, etc. for people. So good news on that front. Yep, definitely. So we'll probably bring this to a close. If anyone's got any further questions, please do submit those through the Q&A boxes and we will come back to you separately. Thanks.